Wait a minute, Marley. Hi, Gregor. Hello there. Yeah. Right. Ah, how are you? Oh, ah, there's your dog. <laughs> oh, fine. That's the dog, yes. He can't understand why he's not getting out for a walk. He says, oh, come well. on, this is walkies time. <laughs> how, how are you keeping? I'm fine, thanks, David. And I hope everybody else is as well. Good, it's yes. great to see familiar faces again. Thank you very much all Isn't for it? joining in. Well, yeah, I think yeah. Somebody, somebody needs to be congratulated for getting us to this point. Well, Agreed. It's it's been <laughs> blind leading the blind. <laughs> Can Richard oh, that's from? Can... It's good that the initiative has been taken. Good, yes. So can, yes. can Richard Armstrong switch his video on? If anybody can hear me, I'm not sure. The, the name Francis is my wife's name. It's actually Michael. Ah. <laughs> Russell Barr, hello. You know you can change that, Francis? By just Russell clicking Darling, it. hello. You can. Hello. I can change it now. Oh, are you FSB? Will you treat? You have How to are go you to surviving with Mark and Spencer not being available? <laughs> Hello, Tom. It's good to see you Hello. looking good. Yes, yes. Back hey, again. Thank you. Uh -huh. Excellent. Right. Well, we're fairly time constrained today because we don't yet have the license to operate mm -hmm. uh, ad infinitum. So maybe if this is, you know, works very well, uh, the committee will decide to get, get the license and uh, we'll be able to have future meetings. But at the moment, all I can say is welcome and thank you very much for joining in. This is our first effort. So um, it seems to have gone OK so far. Uh, excellent. I'll, I'll cross my fingers or maybe it's a case of keeping them crossed uh, that everything proceeds. Now, we've got John Robert with us from um, Dunbar Life Boat Station. Uh, he's given me the briefest uh, of biographies I have ever, ever had. Um, <laughs> all I know about this gentleman is that he's called John Robert. I now see he's called Yunsen. I didn't know that before. <laughs> and um, he's told me that he's a member of Dunbar Lifeboat uh, crew for some four years, I think, uh, John, John Robert. Yes, yes. That, that is the height of my knowledge about you in this wonderful... Um, uh, e uh, email rich and uh, technologically rich uh, era <laughs> but well, consider yourselves consider yourself now introduced what i'll ask everybody else to do uh, or not ask you i'm going to mute everybody so we don't get sort of uh, phone calls and uh, hiccups and all things like that happening and at some point in the future i'll ask you to unmute and that'll allow everyone back in one other thing could you all uh enable your chat. Uh, I think if you can see down the bottom uh, screen, if you enable your chat, you will be able to send messages um, and that will allow you to post any questions which you might want to ask. I'm going to try and filter the questions so that I can see if several people are going to ask the same question or whatever. Um, so that'll be a means of communication uh, independent of John Robert. Okay, so everybody start the chat. I'm going to unmute you now and we finish the meeting at 9.35. David, did you want the video off or not? Um, you can go, if you go to view, you can go to speaker view and that'll allow you to sort of get rid of all the uh, visual detritus. Okay? Yeah, yeah. I just, oh, okay. Right, go to mute you now. If you have a question, just send it via chat. And uh, yeah. over to you, John Robert. Okay, so hopefully everybody can hear me okay. So uh, just first things first, it's not just me on the call. So I don't know if you noticed um, in the group, there's also uh, Douglas White. So he's joined one of the crew as well. He's waving away. And there's also Nick Mailer. So he's going to hopefully wave as well. So Nick and Douglas are on the crew as well. Uh, Nick and I joined about the same time. And Douglas has been on a bit longer than, uh, than myself and Nick. Um, so obviously, if I can't answer questions, hopefully, hopefully the guys can. So uh, appreciating as well that time is limited. I've tried to keep it short and concise uh, with the thought that uh, yourselves might have some questions to ask. If not, then uh, we can finish up early and everybody can go for a cup of coffee and get the dog out for a walk. So uh, hopefully all going well. If I share this with you, 
So this is the first trial for, for me as well. So uh, two seconds, if it, if it works. Okay. So yep, you're aboard. That, that'll come for yourself. So uh, obviously, um, <clears throat> pardon me. So in, in the past, we would have invited you to come down to the lifeboat station or we would have come to an event with yourselves, but uh, COVID, um, as it is, um, we have all had to move very much like yourselves to an online forum where we uh, we try and do these kind of talks and presentations and, and give you kind of background and feedback. So uh, bear with us a little bit. This is the first time I've been given this presentation. Um, I've tried to kind of adjust it a little bit based on the information I have. So hopefully it will all be useful. Um, if not, then we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll get some feedback from yourselves as you're the first trial case as well. So uh, anyway. So just a, a little bit of background. Um, so hopefully, as, as, as you'll know, we're approaching our 200-year uh, year anniversary through the RNLI, founded in 1824. And you'll have heard the, feed, the, the stories of Florence Nightingale um, and, the, and the infamous boat rescue that she had. Um, RNLI has come on a, a lot more than it has in the past um, and, and things moving forward. And to give you an idea, I don't have any information for 2020, but to give you an idea, in 2019 as a whole, uh, RNLI rescued 38,000 people um, throughout the UK and Northern Ireland and Ireland itself. Uh, and when you talk about there, the life saved by crews and lifeguards, that's 374 people. So quite a number of people when you think about it, if you space that out over every day, um, it's quite a, quite a number when you see it. Um, so the thing with the RNLI, with the background, and I wanted to kind of give you some kind of ideas on, on what we do and how many people we have. So 95% of the RNLI is run through volunteering. So all the people that you see, they are um, volunteers. Now, uh, Dunbar itself has two full-time crew. So we have a mechanic and we have um, a coxswain but out with that, everyone else that takes part in the RNLI that contributes, that volunteers through the shop, through the lifeboat station are all volunteers. And to give you an idea of uh, overall RNLI, when you think about that, so uh, from the statistics that I have here, that's 23,000 people throughout the UK and Ireland that volunteer to take part in the, in the RNLI. And that's 5,500 volunteer crew, that's 3,500 shore crew, and um, 180 volunteer lifeguards. And to give you a kind of idea of a background, and again, this is just some numbers to get the bit started with while I have your attention. Um, if I was to ask somebody to come off mute, because I can do a bit of interactive, does anybody have any idea how much it costs to run the RNLI in, in 2019? Or, or it's, been, it's been going up ever since. So anybody have any idea how much it costs to run the RNLI as a whole? Bearing in mind 95% of the people who run it or volunteers any I any figures or numbers or thoughts i think the only person who can speak at the moment is me so i'm going to have to estimate 20 million 20 million okay so if i was to say times that by nine so in 2019 it cost the charity 181 million pounds to run the rnli and that spread out over 238 lifeboat stations. So it gives you an idea of the cost. And the stark figure with that is, is that money does not come from any public funding. So that money purely comes from fundraising and charitable donations. So it gives you an idea of the, of the sheer scale of the organization that, uh, that we're part of. Um, so <clears throat> said there are five and a half thousand of to you. And as it says there, most of the crew there that uh, that, that take part or that, that volunteer, including myself, we're ordinary people that do ordinary jobs. So um, Douglas and Nick, I'm sure they can come on and give you a little bit of background to themselves as well. But for myself, I work in the oil and gas industry. And so when I come back home from my leave period, I basically volunteer for the full length of time I'm back. Obviously, COVID's made it a little bit more complicated. Um, and I'm sure Nick and, and Doug would come on now and just give you a little bit of background to themselves as well. Hopefully. Do you want to meet? Oh. Hi, I don't yes. know if you can hear me. Sorry, hi, I'm Douglas. Um, yes, uh, as JR was saying, so I'm, I'm by trade, I'm a journalist. Um, I had no real um, seafaring background um, before I joined up, apart from the odd sailing experience um, and that goes really probably for, probably for the majority of our volunteer crew and now at the moment you know in the past it would have 
drawn heavily, almost exclusively from the fishing community, but um, now it's uh, you know it's a real cross section of society. And I've been on the crew about six years. I serve on both boats we have at Dunbar, our inshore and our all weather Trent lifeboat, which is uh, moored down at Dunbar, uh, down at Torness. And um, and I also with Nick um, help with the media coverage for the station. So we help promote our shouts, any interesting stories, fundraising efforts. Um, that's what we do. And Nick, anything from yourself? Oh, I'm unmuted already. Hi, everyone. I'm, uh, so as Dougie said, yeah, I, I uh, volunteer as uh, one of the uh, lifeboat press officers at Dunbar. So um, the, when I'm not on either of the boats, I'm uh, thinking about how we can kind of uh, get our message out to uh, people like yourselves in the community. So um, uh, I'm a, a, as Dougie said, he's a, he's a, he, he handles the words. He's a, a journalist. I happen to be a professional photographer. So um, it's quite handy. We're, we're a good team when it comes to getting the message out. So I handle all the images. Um, can't think of much else to say at the moment, but there we go. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. And, and, and like I was saying there for myself, I, I don't have any seafaring experience. As, as Douglas was saying, normally would have been called from the fishing community. Um, I'm from the far north in Shetland originally, um, but that does not mean that I like boats in general or was good with boats. Um, I just uh, came to Dunbar and the call came out for a volunteer crew and uh, I think my wife pushed me along more than I did, so uh, hence why I've ended up. So I wanted to give you a bit of background as well. So um, none of us, there's only one of us that I think is involved in farming on the crew, but you see the, the lifeboat, the, the PPE that the individual is wearing here. So I didn't have a picture of, or, or a glossy picture of the, the PP, the other, the other set that we wear. So uh, as Douglas alluded, there, Douglas alluded to there, there's two lifeboats that we have, and we'll talk about them in a little minute, but I wanted to give you a bit of background on the PP that we have. So the, the gear that this guy is wearing here, this is for our um, all-weather lifeboat. So, uh, and we'll tell you about that in a minute. So to give you an idea there, what he's wearing, he's got welly boots, he's got like these kind of dungaree overalls, he's got a, a, a base layer, that goes underneath. So it's like kind of the old long johns that you would see in the movies, um, top and bottom. And then there's a, a thinner jacket that goes over the top. There's a thicker jacket that goes over the top of that. And then there's the um, life jacket itself. And then on top of that, we also have um, what could be described as like a, like a hard hat, um, a white hard hat that you might see in some of the pictures that you maybe seen before. And to give you an idea, so this is all made by Heli Hansen. To give you an idea, um, the Heli Hansen um, clothing and boots that we wear, so not the life jacket, just the, the, the clothing that we wear, that's £1,500 for, for that per, per crew member. And the life jacket itself is about £500. Um, because Dunbar has two different lifeboats, there's also a different set of gear, which you might have seen if you've seen like divers that have the, the dry suits that they wear. So we would wear on the inshore lifeboat and Douglas and Nick and myself are all based on the inshore lifeboat as well. So we would have a set of that. And to give you an idea, one of those suits just on their own is nearly 800 pounds. So you can see that the kind of costs are running the charity kind of stack up. And um, one of the most important things that you might see is when people say, what's the most important lifeboat? The most important one is the, is the money tin, the, 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 the one where we put the donations in, because that's what basically keeps the charity going. Um, so what I've got here is I've hopefully got a couple of pictures that you can see, the D-Class and the Trent. So I can go on a little bit, or Nick or Douglas, if you would like to give some background, if you have, um, it's up to yourselves. Um, if not, I've got the information here. So um, any any preference, guys? Yeah, don't mind. I, don't, I can give a wee bit of a plot of history and, you know, Nick, yep. obviously, feel free just to jump in. Um, so, yeah, so we've got two boats at Dunbar. Um, the D-Class is, is also called the Inshore, which, as the name suggests, is great for um, getting around the coastal areas. Anyone stranded, uh, cut off by the tide or, um, you know, maybe stuck on rocks or anyone falling in the water around the shore, that, that boat's brilliant. Um, the RNLI describe it as the workhorse of the fleet um, because it goes out far more times than any other, um, any of our different classes. Um, although last year our shouts were equal for both boats, um, ordinarily the, the D class would normally be called out more on a normal year. Um, it can take a maximum crew of four, and it can also go out with three. Um, as you can see, it's kind of it's a, you know rigid inflatable. Um, it's got a top. It's got a service speed of a, well, between twenty and twenty-five knots, um, and it's a you know it's a fantastic boat. Um, 
the all weather boat. The current boat we've got used to be part of the relief fleet and we received it in 2008 after the heavy storm um, caused our previous Trent to be uh, cut back. The storm was so ferocious at Torness it broke free of it. it actually, it was still attached to its mooring. Uh, the this, this storm ripped it from the seabed and it crashed against the rocks at Torness and was completely out of service. Um, and so the people were then given the replacement um, boat. So, um, and that can take a crew of about, two, well, normally about seven or eight. Um, and it can, as the name suggests, again, it's an all weather boat. It's got a range of 250 miles, service speed of 25 knots, and um, it's self writing. So if it gets knocked over in a wave, it can write itself. Um, again, it's a fantastic boat. Um, and, you know, it's most notable shouts in recent years was when our coxswain Gary Fairbairn received a bronze medal for bravery when he and the crew went to rescue a Swedish a Swedish couple who were on board a yacht um, which was in which was caught in treacherous weather um, and they, they were honoured by for their bravery on for that as well so yeah that, that's our two boats. And uh, I don't know if anybody's seen uh, Saving Lives at Sea on BBC Two. Uh, maybe some hands if you have or if you haven't, but ultimately you would have seen our, our both our lifeboats um, in the recent episodes. One where there was a, a group of kids that were stuck just outside the harbour entrance. And uh, this year when, when Saving Lives at Sea was on, there was a, a two ladies who'd gotten cut off by the tide um, just down by Thornton Loch. And, uh, and both those lifeboats at that point were involved in, uh, in rescuing those people. So, uh, so yes, and and to give you an idea again, and this is just the, the stark figures. I have the figures here. So if you were to um, buy one of the D-class lifeboats, the little small one there, uh, you're talking about eighty-six thousand pounds. And throughout the life of that boat, it'll cost about a quarter of a million pounds to maintain and operate that boat. And although I don't have any figures for the uh, the Trent, we uh, we have our new Shannon-class lifeboats, which are the um, <clears throat> the new breed of all weather lifeboat. And to give you an idea, one of those Shannons that come out, that's about two million pounds just for that boat to build and deliver. And it costs about another three and a half. And if you put that into start reality, I said there was 238 lifeboat stations, there's 445 lifeboats all in and 164 of those are all weather ones. So it gives you an idea again, that it's the scale of, of this that we, that we take part in. So, um, the last, the kind of last few slides I have here, um, I'll assume that everyone here is fit and nimble in, uh, you know, sea swimming and swimming pools and, and all those things that you take part in. So uh, maybe, maybe not. But if you uh, if you do, this is the message that to give you an idea. So as much as we uh, present to to yourselves, we do a lot of work through um, schools and um, kind of uh, clubs and. Um, and, and organizations where a lot of young kids are involved. And obviously you get some instances where things may happen around the coast where um, unfortunately people end up in situations they shouldn't. So one of the ones that we do teach is how to uh, give yourself the best chance if you do end up in the water. So one of the ones we do say is that if you do end up in the water and the, and the message that we teach the kids as much as we show them our lifeboats and, and all the gear that we have is that if you do end up there, obviously fight your instinct when you're in the water. Uh, you lean back, and as this person's doing here, the thing that we teach is to lean, to, 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 to lie back, to open up into like a starfish and basically start to control your breathing. And then hopefully you can float. And the longer that you can do this, the longer that gives us the opportunity as lifeboat crew to hopefully come out and, and save you. So, uh, so, yeah. And so that's that's kind of I tried to do it kind of in, in a quick potted summary because we only had 40 minutes and I was kind of hoping there might be some Q&A. Um, so we'll kind of leave it at that. That's the kind of 20 minutes in, and I think you maybe only got about 15 minutes left there, um, David and Ian. So I was going to open it up, um, and hopefully between Nick and Douglas and myself, we can we can answer some questions, and uh, and then we can go from there. So I think everybody can unmute if they need to. I think you've got to uh, stop sharing screen. Stop sharing. That's stop fine. Yeah. There we go. Okay. And uh, let's see now. I've had one question. I shall now ask everybody to unmute. <coughs> okay, everybody unmuted? Yeah. Thank you. Well, we've had one question from Tony. Um, Tony, do you want to give your question? Yes, what it was you... about the uh, D-class. Um, 
but it looked a bit crowded and the question is how many rescued persons will the d-class take on board I think the short answer is as many as we can carry, really. Um, you know, to be honest, if, you know, if there's a boat in trouble and people are there, we'll carry as many as we can. Um, you know, with, with just, you know, obviously our helm is the person in charge. She has to make a safety call, you know, based on the crew and the passengers, you know, the, and the casualties. Um, but yeah, basically, yeah, if we can take them, um, we will. Um, I mean, I was on a shout where the helm left me in the water so he could take the people, the casualties <laughs> and came back for me. But again, he'd made that judgment call, I was safe. Um, so, you know, our priority is to get the casualties out of the water, get them back safe so you know, they can get medical treatment and then, you know, and then we just take it from there. So, yeah. Okay, <laughs> but, thank you. Thank sorry, you. I was gonna, I was gonna add to that is we carry three um, inflatable uh, buoyancy aids so we can give that to, to casualties when they come on board so that would be one thing that would limit but as I said depending on the circumstances we just get them out of the water and take them back to the harbour yes okay thanks gonna, so much just going to add to Douglas is one there if you uh, if you saw the there was an episode of Saving Lives at Sea where uh, they actually had four crew and then they rescued three people one after the other in a kind of one after the other shout. And when you saw seven people in this little boat, you did realize just how small it was. And, uh, and it, 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 it's, um, yeah, if, if you get a chance to come down and hopefully once COVID's all over and, and we can invite you to the station, you'll hopefully hopefully get a chance to see it. And uh, it, is a, it is small when you start thinking about the amount of people that are in there. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay, I haven't had, I haven't seen any other questions yet, so I'll, I'll grab. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to put. Last I don't know how to ask a question. How, Hello. How do you ask a question? Hello. Okay. Hi, hi, Ian. Hi. How do you ask a question? Uh, just, just ask now. Okay. Um, how many uh, potential volunteers uh, for the lifeboat are debarred because they have seasickness? And if they have seasickness, sea can you ever stop being seasick? You know, can you ever train yourself not to be seasick? Or I'm do you probably not. Get... I'm probably not the best one to speak about this. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, I mean, actually, we've had crew. I mean, what we, what happens is if 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 um, when new volunteers come along for the crew, they're always taken out. And, you know, primarily, well, there's lots of reasons for that is it's obviously to get them to, you know, to see if if they like it, if they're suitable for us and all similarly for us to see if they can, you know, they can do us a job. And, um, but one of the things is to obviously see people if they do have sea legs. Um, you know, we had a female crew member not that long ago who uh, just unfortunately had to step down as a volunteer because she just couldn't get over it. You know, she was just, especially on the, uh, uh, all weather trend so it seems to be a lot worse there obviously you're going out in uh, rougher seas but also uh -huh. the rolling of the boat rather than the yeah. you know plowing straight into waves doesn't seem to be the problem yeah. it's the rolling sideways motion um so some people do get afflicted by it other people you know it's it comes and goes i mean some people you know you can be sick but then that doesn't impact you being able to do the job um so as i said our first you know from the, the helm and the coxswain's point of view they're always going to look out this for the crew and making sure they're safe but um it's up to probably the person's preference if it you know if it's if it's impacting on them so severely that you know they feel they're a hindrance to the crew then they might have to step down yep there, there I, is uh, no, there uh, no uh, test for sea sickness can you hear if me you want, if you want to ask a question verbally it would help us i think if you just raised your hand and uh, yeah. that would be a means of identifying you okay that looks like uh Who's that? Robin. Robin. It's Philip. Hello. Can you Hello, hear me? Yeah. Yep. Ask a um, question. Right. Um, in the old fashioned terms, the maroon goes off. But now, obviously, people are contacted a different way. What happens then? They congregate or assemble at a particular point. How do you choose the crew and what happens? Well, Nick, you are. You are. You are. Well, that well I, was, I was relevant to the last question actually what, what I was going to say um, uh, regarding seasick kind of covers uh, a little bit uh, of what, what you're talking about yourself there Robin so um, yes in, in normal times um, we have a pager we also have a system called our cams which works with our mobile phones um, so we would be paged rather than uh, 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 hearing a maroon go off um, and uh, we, we respond to the station 
um, at which point the, the coxswain will pick his crew. For, for the ALB, the coxswain will pick the crew um, that's going to go to sea. So that point uh, is relevant to the seasickness point because if it's a force nine, he's not going to choose the, the, the people he knows that might suffer from the seasickness, but um, he'll choose the people he knows can 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 tolerate it. Um, and then and then you go to sea. Um, again, similarly for the for the inshore lifeboat. Um, Obviously, that's that's we've been impacted by uh, uh, the, the pandemic in that we, we can't really be congregating at the station. So um, for a long time during uh, lockdown, we were we were working with a, a, essentially a duty crew. So there were four for the inshore lifeboat. The, 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 the two boats were split into into two um, two crews and we would respond depending on what type of shout it was. So it does come up on our pager, which boat is being tasked. Um, and we would respond if we were duty crew that day, um, rather than everyone gathering outside the station with masks on and 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 running the risks that there are there. So that that's how it how, how it kind of works. Any further? Yeah, thank you. And and just and just to close out the sea sickness, but I I'll be honest and say I average about once a year, but there's no rhyme nor reason as to why I get seasick. I've had. I've been a bit seasick on a flat calm day and then the next time it's howling wind and gale and everybody finds so uh, I don't really understand that I blame the pizza or or the pasta one of the two so uh, <laughs> for the beer so yeah oh, no no <laughs> Tony you had a question I think you got a hand up there yes another question about the d-class it fascinates me this boat um, because I believe you said it, it's got a range of 250 miles and it does 25 knots um would you seriously do that, or would is there a limit to where you would normally travel to at twenty five knots in, in bad weather? Sorry, that was the um, it was the, it's the all weather boat that has that range. Um, I think the for the D class we um, um, we have two it's 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 fueled by two um, uh, sort of fuel pockets that run down this, the inside of the boat. <laughs> And so obviously one's connected each time. So there's always a good rule of thumb is if, you know, however far we're traveling, sometimes we're tasked up to North Berwick or, you know, Tantalon mm -hmm. or, or, you know, further east as well. And um, the rule of thumb for the helm is if the, you know, if, if we run out of fuel on one bag and have to switch to the other one, well, we know we've got enough to get back. Yeah. Yeah. So that's generally the kind of, uh, you know, how they kind of work it out. But I think it each bag takes 30 liters of fuel. And I think we can run for a couple of hours. Depend, obviously, it depends on the revs and depends on how you know how much you're hammering the engine um, yeah. as to how long you're going to be. Um, but that's, sorry, that's maybe the, where the confusion came on the range. Okay, thank you. I, I'd be interested in knowing how, uh, to what extent you actually actively promote safety at sea. Uh, do you go visit schools and this sort of thing? Or yeah. Not? So, uh, so I'll, I'll take it. So, so Nick and Douglas, as we said, uh, take care of the. The, the press and the communication side of things. So um, I'm actually the, <laughs> sounds fancier than it is, I'm the, the visits officer. So as part of my role there, so we would normally invite yourselves uh, or we go and do talks. But what we do is we do outreach through the community. So we go to the Dunbar Primary School, um, the, the high school. We would go to the Cubs. We've got the Sea Scouts, the Cubs, the Cub Scouts, the Scouts, the next one. There's um, the Brownies. Um, we also do work through um, the Wave Project um, and the Dunbar Surf Lifesaving Club. So what we do is we do the, the promoting the message around sea safety um, letting them come and see the lifeboat station itself, and then, as as I said a bit there about the you know how you know floating to live. So what we do is we have a number of topics that we can then roll out. So as much as they get to come and see the lifeboat, or we talk about the gear and the equipment we have, we get to teach about the sea safety part of it and what people should do, and 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 even straight down to the to the youngest ones. I think the youngest ones and Douglas came to it was when I went to my son's uh, nursery class. So you would have talked about. Two, three year olds, maybe three, three year olds, something like that. We all we all basically went to there and, and showed them what we did and talked about safety and, and and the simple message of, you know, if your dog goes in the sea, what do you do? You stand on the shore, you don't go to the beach without mommy and daddy. And then we we developed that message all the way through. Um, and we even did one I didn't attend, but we did one with um Dunbar Primary School where we were invited just before summer. And I think that was a mass assembly where again 
we talked about the dangers of, of being around the coast and how to enjoy it responsibly and safely. So um, there's a big part of, of this is, is not just going out in that big orange lifeboat. It, it's about how we promote people safely and enjoying the coast because it's, it's there to be enjoyed. It's just doing it enjoyably and responsibly. Thank you. We've got about uh, six minutes left with a question from Graham. How yep. long does it take to respond to a call out? Given that the drink book is down at Torness. Yes. Um, well, do you want me to? Do <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there is a, there is a, there is a, there is a time delay with um, with the train because um, ordinarily what would happen is the crew musters at the Dunbar station and then we transfer down in the Land Rover and then launch from there. But really, I mean, we, can, we, we the coxswain would hope to be at sea or launched in about 15, 20 minutes from the pager first going off or from the call being raised. Um, obviously there can be some certain factors that can speed that up, but you know, if the crew's already at the station and then it's getting passed um, as a follow-up to the D-class already being launched, then that can be able to reduce the time. But that's that's generally what we're looking at. Um, sorry, just to explain the situation at Torness, um, the boat sits on a mooring and we um, our gear is, is based down there. So once we come off the Land Rover, we go into the, a cabin, get dressed in our gear, and then we board a boarding boat, which the, the boarding boat itself has to be launched because it's up on a it's up on the pier. It has to be lowered down on a davit. We get on the boarding boat, the boarding boat goes up, up um, towards the the Trent, and then that has to be started, and then you know all that before we can release ourselves from the mooring and launch. So it's a you know, it's not just a case of even just getting down there and jumping on it. It's a bit of an involved process. Thank you. Thank you. Hamish, you had a question? Yeah, it was all really the same thing. I was going to ask if you had a maximum distance when volunteers came forward before you would appoint them as a volunteer or whether they lived too, or worked too far away. So for, for, for Nick and I, we probably live the furthest away from the station. So we are at New Dunbar or Nick's, Nick's at the kind of, just, just at the kind of out skirts of Dunbar and, and I'm the same myself so I, I time it normally it normally takes me about six minutes from um, when I get the call to when I'm at the station and that's obviously adhering to the speed limits because that's what you have to do um, but there's obviously people that live um, within a running out the door but the only slight problem with that is people who probably leave their house close to the station get dressed I think I went down to a call out in my pajamas so uh, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't the prettiest sight, shall we say? But luckily, um, luckily it was uh, it was okay. Um, but yeah, there's there's obviously a, a, a within a an area, but it's within the Dunbar area itself. So um, as much as we obviously value the, the 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 time to get out from the station, um, there is a level of the crew that will come forward and volunteer. So um, thankfully, from the coxswain's point of view, he's very amenable to to a lot of these things. Okay, much. we're now we're now getting down almost to the last minute, three minutes. So, Ian, uh, before can yep. I ask, just before Ian, um, is your question going to be fairly quick? Uh, how how dangerous is sailboarding in the Forth? The reason I asked this is many years ago we had a keen trainee who used to do sailboarding, and he told me he used to go down and sailboard round the Bass Rock and back, and I just think, thought that was pretty dangerous, but. Um, do people do that mad things like that? Um, there's always there's sailboard? always some interesting one. We we had a call out recently where the individual had windsurfed from windsurf, Fife, yeah. had Fifed for had windsurfed from Fife to North Berwick, and unfortunately had gotten caught <laughs> out. So at the end of the day, it's with everything as long as it's done responsibly, and as long as you take the correct provisions on your way and have the ability to call for help, we'll we'll come out. So uh, you know, it's it's assessing that condition and that situation and making sure that you're within your capabilities. And then, and then, like I said, we're we're there um, to make sure that uh, that you can get back safely if you do get caught out. And as that person did, unfortunately, he did get caught out. Um, but yep. thankfully, we were all there to to take care of him. That's, Thank that's super. Thank you. Um, we've got two minutes left. And before uh, I ask a, a, another question, I just wanted to say thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. Yep. That's uh, Douglas, Nick and, and John uh, for appearing this morning and uh, telling us all about the local station. It is a, a mystery to us outside uh, as to what goes on in any institution. And it is marvellous to see three of the guys who are actually present down at Dunbar, looking after us at sea, 
Um, I, I know I, I do a bit of sailing in the West Coast and uh, I'd be extremely pleased to see a lifeboat appearing if I got into trouble. So thank you, gentlemen, not only for what you do out there, but for appearing this morning. It's been super. This has been our kind of first effort. Um, I think it so far seems to have gone reasonably well. We've now got less than a minute. So what I can do, because <laughs> Zoom cuts us off without uh, any by your leave, um, is if anybody has a short question, fire in. And, and, then and a very, cut off. <laughs> a very, a very quick one from my one is obviously thank you very much. This is the first kind of proper run with an official presentation that I've been given as well. So, uh, uh, David, if you wanted to ask for any feedback from anybody, uh, it would be really appreciated. Just to you know, could we could we present it better or include some more information or you know just just anything you guys anything that that that, that, that the group may have would be greatly appreciated. So anyway, um, last last one there I think. We'll Ian. Yeah, last. Uh, Comment from me is it? Yeah, it seems to have gone better than we might have thought. Um, I've been recording it. Hopefully, I'll be able to find the file. Um, <laughs> I've opened up a YouTube account for us, and I'll upload it to that. I'll send the link to the Dunbar boys, and they can Thank see you. and review it from their own perspective of how well it's done. I'm in touch with the Navy as being the next possible uh, Zoom meeting. Perfect. And are you okay if we shared 